Today, we watch in awe as modern day explorers push beyond the limits of our planet and into the limitless depths of outer space. Centuries ago, the world's oceans presented the same challenge and fascination for mankind. Beyond the horizon was the unknown. During the 16th and 17th centuries, the world's great navigators, the Dutch, the British, the French and the Portuguese, were seriously exploring the southern oceans and bringing word of a great new continent. In 1642, Dutchman Abel Tasman, sailing east on the 42nd latitude with his ships Heemskerk and Zeen, sighted a shore which he believed was part of this great south land. He guided his ships deeper into the southern ocean and skirted the coastline, eventually finding a suitable anchorage where he stopped briefly and decided this would be named Van Diemen's Land. Tasman's discovery would remain undisturbed for more than 150 years until the very early 1800s. European settlement came to the Great South Land in the wake of Captain Cook's voyage of discovery in 1770. Sydney Town was established in 1788 on the shores of the beautiful Port Jackson, a colonial outpost on the other side of the earth which would serve as a penal colony, catering for the overflow of convicts from England's grossly overcrowded jails. In 1803, it was apparent the colony of New South Wales, as it was then known, needed to strengthen its tenuous hold on this huge continent. Explorers Bass and Flinders had proven in 1798 that Tasman's discovery was in fact an island. So the decision came to secure it with the establishment of Hobart Town on that island's southeast corner. Like Sydney, it too was sighted on the shores of a magnificent deep water port. It was also to become a penal colony, but not until 1818. The sole line of communication from Sydney and Hobart towns with Mother England was with the sailing ships. These ships would regularly undertake the perilous six-month voyage from England to Sydney and Hobart, bringing new settlers and more convicts. Both cities were then administered from the colony of New South Wales. As the colony developed and prospered, the changes came. Sydney would be the capital of the state of New South Wales, and Hobart the premier city for the island state of Tasmania. Today, Sydney and Hobart have established their own unique identities. Yet a common bond remains through the sea and the power of sail. Just as in those early days, where sailing ships sailed the 630 nautical miles between the two ports, much smaller vessels sail the same course today. For them, it is a race. The Sydney to Hobart Classic, a contest seen as one of the world's truly great offshore tests. Since 1945, adventure-loving sailors have been meeting the challenge of the Sydney-Hobart race each year. From humble and uncertain beginnings in the post-war years when nine ramshackle yachts manned by thrill-seekers first raced south, it has grown to where we now celebrate its golden anniversary with a fleet of around 400, among them some of the world's best. This is the story of the 50 golden years of the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, a salute to the great cities and sailors who have made it what it is today. It's one of the world's greatest waterways, Sydney Harbour. And since the very first days of European settlement, Sydney sighted have found it a haven for recreation. For the past 50 years, one single harbour event has become a sporting tradition for the city and its sailors. It's the start of the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Like so many great sporting events, this one came into existence via a casual chat and a drink between two enthusiastic sailors. The late Jack Earl, a marine artist of international repute, was considering a family cruise to Tasmania for Christmas 1945. One day, while anchored in a bay on the harbour, he spotted the Tasmanian yacht Saltair, owned by Bert Walker. He rode across and asked Walker if he could check his charts of the Tasmanian coast. He suggested that uh, 
he'd like to come along too and make a company cruise of it, you know, and I thought, why not, you know, it'd be fine. So, and then Peter Luke heard about it, and Peter was a great friend of mine, a great sailor too. And uh, he, he, he said he'd like to join us, there was three of us going to sail down there. And, uh, and then he met Ellingworth, and Ellingworth said, well, I think Peter said, why don't you come in the race? And he said, why don't you make a race of it, you know? And that's how it started off. Their chosen course would take them over 630 nautical miles and encompass some of the most challenging waters known to sailors. Waters where, in an instant, a wafting breeze can be replaced by a full-blown gale and gentle swells can become liquid mountains, their foaming crests being an avalanche capable of engulfing small yachts. But just as it can be tough, it can feature captivating calms. And when the yachts are close to shore, the crews can sample some of the world's most beautiful coastal scenery. The course map looks this way. On leaving Sydney Harbour and turning south, the yachts are in the Tasman Sea. They progress down the New South Wales coast to the always moody waters of Bass Strait, then on down the Tasmanian east coast. At Tasman Island, they turn to the west and head for the Derwent River. Once in the river, it's an 11 nautical mile run home to Hobart. It's a course that has always tested the sailing skills and stamina of sailors. Crews race around the clocks for between three and five days, getting fitful moments of sleep when and where possible. The rough weather can be boat busting and body breaking, the calms mind bending. To complete the course is commendable. To win the race is an outstanding sporting achievement. Back in 1945, the spirit of adventure the Sydney Hobart race presented was the perfect panacea for a war-weary Australia. Finally, men were putting to sea on small ships for the fun of it and not to defend the nation's shores. The inaugural race's impact on the community was reflected in this historic newsreel telling the story of that very first race. Wayfarers all, as some of the nine seagoing yachts prepare for their 630 mile race from Sydney to Hobart. At the invitation of the organisers, naval officers check the equipment of each vessel to ensure they can stand up to the rigours of a strenuous voyage. The Amber Merle, 34 foot Bermudan cutter and her crew in last minute preparations. Captain Illingworth is one of the prime movers in the cruising yacht club which organised the race. He supervises the loading of supplies in his 35-foot cutter, Rani. Veteran skipper Walker and his son head the crew of the 44-foot Bermudan catch, Salt Air, which they built. Mr. Walker uses a gauge to test the tautness of rigging wire. A Tasmanian entrant, Winston Churchill, is a 51-foot cutter, as sturdy as its name. Skipper Coverdale broke his arm on the way up. Biggest boat in the race, the schooner Mistral goes down to Manly to the post and the field lines up for the start. The race can take anything from four days to a month, so it's an exciting moment as they turn their bowsprits to the heads and make for the open sea. They clear Port Jackson. Next stop, Hobart. Today, it's plain sailing. But tomorrow, a southerly may buffet timbers and flay the sails. But the stout little ships sail on, man-made beauty matching the wind-etched lines of wave and sky. Ship to Ship presents moving pictures of memorable grace, a canvas painted in white, green and blue, a scene that can never fail to charm in any sea-girt land or among any peoples who go down to the sea in ships. Remember the happy crew in the cockpit of Winston Churchill in the newsreel? Well, here are two of them, Max Crease and Keith Wilson, both now in their 80s. We brought them together in Hobart for the first time in 50 years, just for this golden anniversary story. We, I reckon we raced more going up than we did That's coming right. back, didn't we? Yeah. As far as we're concerned, it was only a cruise back to Hobart. See, there was no running. They told Perth that there was no running sails. Oh, you know, spinnakers around, and then he wouldn't take one. 
So when we got up there, we found that all these other boats were going to use spinnakers <coughs> and light sails. And all we had was a spinnaker was the... Uh, yeah, well, a 15-ounce head sail. Yeah. It? <laughs> and to get it on and off, we used to have to lash the spinnaker pole to the anchor winch. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, she'd lift us out of the boat. <laughs> In reality, England's Captain Illingworth was the only true racing yachtsman among the nine yacht owners contesting that 1945 race, and it showed. Unbeknown to his rivals, he pressed on in teeth of a howling southerly gale, which hit the fleet the second day out. The others either took shelter or stopped and rode out the storm. Some say one crew went ashore and watched a movie. With his yacht Rani not being sighted for four days, the headlines told how the worst was feared. Jack Earl, who raced the stout yacht Kathleen, described how the competitors felt. We've given him away and we'd been so sorry that he's such a nice bloke and so and so was crewing aboard him, we'd miss him too, you know, and all this stuff. And then we found out he was already in there, so we started to sail again. <laughs> An RAAF search plane had brought the news Rani was still afloat, spotted in Storm Bay, heading for Hobart at the head of the fleet. Almost 50 years on, we asked the race's founding father if he could ever have imagined it being what it is today. No way, how could you? No. You couldn't, couldn't imagine the boats would be developed to such an extent as they are today. Now behind me is the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, home to the race since its inception. Recently the club acquired a magnificent collection of half models representing every winner of the race since 1945. That collection gives us a unique insight into the evolution of ocean racing yacht design in Australia. The models were handcrafted in timber by yachtsman and boat builder Tom Stevenson. They're at a 25 to 1 scale, so their size differs quite dramatically. I must point out here, it's not necessarily the yacht that gets to Hobart first that is the actual winner. The first yacht home takes line on us, and usually the bigger the yacht, the faster it is. The yacht which collects the bulk of the trophies is the winner on handicap, that handicap being based on size, shape and sail area of the yacht. Generally, the smaller the yacht, the better the handicap. The collection starts here, with Rani, of course, the 1945 winner. A wholesome little yacht with a long keel and relatively full underbody. The yachts of this era were essentially for cruising. It wasn't until 1954 when the famous brothers Trigg and Magnus Halverson came up with their rapid little racer Solvig, the performance-oriented yachts began to appear. The Halverson influence on the race was strong right through to the early 60s. That was when this yacht, their powerful sloop Freya, came along and won the race on three consecutive occasions, 1963, 64 and 65. An absolutely remarkable achievement. The next dramatic change came in 1976 with Piccolo. She won and started the era of the skiff type yacht, typified by a fat, shallow hull featuring an exceptionally small keel. The concept was fast. It was like the introduction of the turbocharger to yachts. While there have been some maxi winners like Keeloa in 1977 and Sovereign 10 years later, the skiff designs have since dominated the winners list, as is seen right through to the 1993 winner, Cuckoo's Nest. This evolution has not come only with the style of the hulls. Just as we have gone from biplanes to big Boeings in aviation, we have progressed in offshore racing. Sails have gone from heavy canvas to ultra lightweight Kevlar. Hull construction has gone from massive timber planking to space age carbon fibre. And masts have gone from something akin to tree trunks to ultra slim aluminium extrusions. Those early yachts had no winches. Today, sails are controlled using highly efficient systems, and back in the 40s, radios and safety equipment were all but non-existent. Today, they are compulsory. One of the greatest offshore sailors to ever contest the race is Hobart's Jock Muir, a man now into his 80s. His rough weather sailing skills are legendary, and his talents as a yacht designer and builder exceptional. He designed and built Westwood as a fishing cruiser, yet she went out and won the 1947 and 48 races. Muir reflects on those early days. Well, I was mainly involved because the Cruising Yacht Club used to refer to 
that has a cruising club. <coughs> and uh, in the westward, she is designed as a fishing cruiser with a small fish wheel. <laughs> but she performed so well, particularly in bad weather, and I did too, that that was the start of it. So we had two, two success, successive wins, and uh, then we started to drop back a bit. For another veteran Hobart yachtsman, John Bonetto, the golden anniversary race will be his 34th. He says the sailors of those early years were much better. I think the older sailors were better. They had to survive with much uh, less equipment. Um, I owe a great uh, debt to Jock Muir, who taught me a lot. Uh, we were first over the line in Jock Muir's waltzing Matilda, and we didn't have a winch on deck. The, sp the spinnaker was uh, row, was sheeted through uh, a, a big block that I shackled on the end of the main boom and three turns round the bar. And today, in today's language, uh, uh, I've had a crew member say to me, he didn't last long, I might add, oh, winch is broken, we'll have to retire. I told him pretty smartly, we're first over the line without a winch on board. Along its historical course, the Hobart race has grown in stature, both with competitors and the public, to a position today where it is one of the world's three classic ocean races, the others being the Fastnet race out of England and the Newport Bermuda race starting in America. Today, the Hobart is a sporting and media extravaganza with the latest in satellite communications bringing every dramatic moment to television and newspapers. But in the early days, the absence of communications with the yachts from the time they left Sydney until they were spotted approaching Hobart placed considerable pressure on headline-hungry newspaper editors. They wanted the latest progress reports. Aerial observations and coast watches were their only hope. Enter the 1947 race and aspiring young Sydney reporter Frank McNulty. Through ingenuity and a determination for that ever elusive scoop, he became the first person to provide a race report from a competing yacht in a very novel fashion. So on the race day, uh, race start day, uh, the man comes down with a cage of pigeons, three of them, and puts them aboard. We did the best we could to uh, prop the cage up so it wouldn't tumble over when we got out the heads. And uh, we'd worked out a very elemental code that uh, could be put on a piece, on a cigarette paper, terribly tiny. The race started and uh, the following morning, probably almost noon, uh, began the task of getting the pigeons to play their role in the game. They were a very sorrowful looking lot. Anyway, we got the first one out. And one crew member held him upside down so I could get towards the legs. Uh, and he's sort of rolling, the crew member's rolling with the yacht. And I'm rolling, but not quite in sync with him. Uh, the poor little pigeons peddling the air with its two legs. I can tell you it was quite a caper, but we did get the cigarette paper fastened to its leg. And then the pigeon up, we take him up on deck, put him down, say, you know, go. Now it's your turn. You, you, you fly home with that. He wouldn't move. He was sort of staggering around doing a drunken sailor's hornpipe. So finally I got him on the palms of my hands and I was swinging my forearms up and down and up a bit harder each time. And he took off, but fluttered only about four feet and came to rest on the deck. So it began all over again, we got him back and finally got away. We uh, then began launching the other two and went through more or less the same uh, set of problems. But uh, all three did take off. One got back to uh, its base or its loft with the message, which gave the newspaper, the Sunday Sun, uh, an exclusive on developments in the race to that point in time. In that same era, navigation techniques were as basic as the communications, primarily dead reckoning with occasional confirmation coming via a sextant site. Bob Bull was another sailor of note back in the 40s. He told the tale of what was literally the dog watch. Well, we had a couple of um, crew members that were flat earthers. And I think they believed that when we, if we missed Tasmania, we'd fall over the edge. I'm quite sure. 
old sippy Stevens, <laughs> believe that. And uh, Ted Bloor was a, was a bit the same, you know. We used to use this uh, method of navigation. There was known as dog barking. At night, you came in towards the coast until the uh, you could hear the dogs bark and then put back out to sea again. Such was the media and public interest in those early races that it's